This is the Everything 80s Podcast, episode 19, The Story of Micro Machines. This is the Micro Machine Man, presenting the most midget miniature motorcade of Micro Machines. Each one has dramatic details, terrific trim, precision paint jobs, plus incredible Micro Machine pocket play sets. There's a police station, fire station, restaurant, service station, and more. Perfect pocket portables to take any place. And there are many miniature play sets to play with, and each one comes with its own special edition Micro Machine vehicle and fun, fantastic features that miraculously move. Raise the boat lift at the airport marina, man the gun turret at the army base, clean your car at the car wash, raise the toll bridge. And these play sets fit together to form a Micro Machine world. Micro Machine pocket play sets, so tremendously tiny, so perfectly precise, so dazzlingly detailed, you'll want to pocket them all. Micro Machines are Micro Machine pocket play sets sold separately from Galoob. The smaller they are, the better they are. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast, brought to you by Everything80spodcast.com. Or welcome if you're new, thanks for coming on out. And today we're looking at a classic tiny toy, which you have no doubt stepped on a thousand times. It is the story of the Micro Machines. And just to look back at how they were developed and how they're actually a pretty successful toy, money-wise. They made quite a lot through the 80s during an era of a lot of big, big toys. So this will just look back on everything to do with the micro machines. And if you haven't already, before we start, just make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast. I think I'm officially on every podcast format you could possibly, yeah, including Spotify now, iHeartRadio, all of them. I should be there. Okay, let's go. So as far as toys in general go, toy cars have been there since the, like, dawn of time pretty much, as soon as the first, like, rock based toy store in a cave was built they were probably selling some sort of toy car the problem is like how do you put a different spin on that on a very unoriginal idea it's like bring when you bring out any form of like doll or teddy bear or like how do you put a new spin on that and that was obviously very successfully done say in the case of cabbage patch kids they put a new spin on what dolls could be and that's the case with micro machines so just as the quick little description, Micro Machines, they were a line of miniature toys that were originally made by Galoob. They were conceived by an, a man named Clemens V. Heaton Jr. And they were obviously made up of, you know, micro-sized cars and play sets. And probably what, what I say famously got them kind of into the mainstream were their very um, iconic commercials, which you heard at the start of the show, including the... Guinness Book of World Records fastest talker, John Mashita Jr. And we'll talk more about him in a bit. But like I said, I, I don't I love micro machines. I'm sure if you're listening to this show, you like them too. You had them. Um and basically anything to do with a car I was into. So this was just kind of like a, a unique version of that. I mean, Hot Wheels are a mainstay in any kid's toy collection in the eighties. You probably grew up on like Tonka trucks, but there's something um I don't know, just something about the appeal of machinery to a kid because probably you're not allowed anywhere near these things. And again, with like when you're looking at toy manufacturers, how do you tap? Cars will always be a popular toy for kids, but how do you tap into the popular toy car market but you know, create something different? And then if you were to come out with a toy line, how are you going to compete against juggernauts like uh, Hot Wheels from Mattel? You know, it's just... There seems to be no real solution until you think about shrinking them down. And that was all it took to create a new line of toys that caught on like wildfire. They made hundreds of millions of dollars in the 80s, which you wouldn't think from this kind of short, not overly short lived, but just kind of a kind of blip on the radar as far as big time 80s toys. They, you know, Micro Machines, they spawned a very epic video game, which we'll get to as well. Um, They show up in a classic Christmas movie. And it's, you know, it's one of those toys that's like, it's not, it's not the definitive toy of the eighties, but it's definitely in the mix. You know what I mean? Everyone would consider it a mainstay toy. You probably definitely had them. You remember them fondly. Um, So, I mean, that to me is the sign of a successful toy. If it's like in the conversation of iconic other toys. So to look at, the story of this whole thing. It starts in Wisconsin with that guy I mentioned before named Clemens V. Heaton Jr., which is a pretty sweet name. And he owned a toy shop with the greatest name of all time called Fun City USA. And that was in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. So not long after opening Fun City, 
Fun City USA. Make sure the whole name is there. He then started coming up with the idea for micro machines. And he had regularly gone to toy fairs and everything like that. And he ended up meeting someone from that company, Galoop, which now is an old toy company, but, you know, they made their mark with micro machines. But he was, you know, interacting with the people from that company. So they realized Heaton was an inventor. And it was mentioned to him that Galoob wanted to get into the toy car business. Um, you know, that's always going to be a hit toy, but they wanted something that was new and that would also be reasonably priced. So Heaton would come up with a way to make the cars more affordable by just cutting down the size. Like, not all car like I mean the mindset would be like all your cars have to be the matchbox hot wheel size car, but he's like, No, we can make these cheaper. We just gotta make them smaller. They'll still be usable. So you shrink the form factor, that reduces the cost of materials and allows for a cheaper price point. So the real origins on micro machines was just about affordability and making these things as cheap as possible to produce. So he worked with a model maker kind of designer and they didn't take too long and they came up with 24 designs for some of these micro cars and along with a lot of different packaging and stuff like that. So he didn't like, they have a good idea here on his hands. So he might've been able to shop around this new idea, but he was committed to providing something to Galoob. Um, they had this sort of unspoken agreement and turns out they loved the idea and Galoob wanted to sign a contract immediately and get these little, cars on the market so that's what comes into probably the success of marketing micro machines with one of the most memorable you know all-time marketing campaigns for a brand new toy and every kid would be aware of micro machines and um, this was due to the work of a guy named Saul Jodel and one of the founders of Galoob David Galoob they were the two real masterminds behind the marketing for micro machines. So from day one, their vision for the toy line would be seen through resulting it in becoming that like overwhelming success. Like they're very, I mean, you're working in a toy company, like I said, in the like golden age of toys where every property that's coming out is an absolute blockbuster from He-Man, GI Joe, Transformers. I mean, you don't have to even get into all of it. So they they're not stupid. They're looking around and they're seeing the landscape of what toys are. So you can't just like go into something like um we'll 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 figure it out as we go. They had a very um direct vision for what they wanted to do from uh, as soon as they got the idea for these toys all the way through to the like the design, the marketing, the promotion, how it would be presented, and everything like their whole vision was seen through. So they were introduced in 1986. And like I said, not the, the miniature look, I think, obviously made them unique, but I'd say the commercials really kind of took it to the next level. And that's what features Fast Talker, John Mashita Jr. And like I said, you might not have known his name or this might be the first time you've actually heard his name, but you know exactly who I'm talking about just from the commercial at the start of the show or just imagining back to that old um, original commercial. And he would be the face and basically, more importantly, the voice of Micro Machines. And Mashida was born in 1956 and was a singer and an actor who had the ability for extremely rapid speech delivery. He had the ability, or I guess has, the ability to articulate 586 words per minute. And he held this record until it was broken in 1990. It was broken by a guy who could do 637 words per minute. Then again, it was broken in 1995 uh, by someone who could do 655 words per minute. But apparently there are questions to the legitimacy of these new records. It doesn't matter what field you're in. There's going to be some form of, of beef and controversy behind it. So with Mishida, you like depending on how old you are or if you know your marketing history, you know he was uh, burst onto the scene in the FedEx commercial for the Fast Talking man and this you know the whole speedy delivery thing you can look up those videos on youtube if you want to see it but he would end up appearing in over 750 different tv and radio commercials also appeared a ton of on a ton of tv shows that you may or may not remember including you probably remember him on saved by the bell he was also uh, on garfield and friends he appeared on sesame street he was in pinky and the brain he showed up in shows like robot chicken 
And probably even more importantly, if you're a kid of the 80s, he was the voice of Blur in the Transformers movie. So his involvement in the Micro Machines commercial made them really stand out. You know, because if you think of most commercials through the 80s, you, you pretty much just see kids playing with the toys. You know what I mean? It's just like a shot of them outside and they've built this like sand castle thing in their backyard and they're playing and interacting with the toys. But these were a lot different because now you had this um, engaging person with the, the speed talking presenting the toy, which is basically hadn't been done at the time. So, and interesting, like you'd think I was watching these back. None, nothing in these commercials was enhanced or edited in any way. What you're hearing is actually John Mashita letting it rip. Like it, it's like full takes, nothing's cut in, nothing sped up. What you're seeing is the actual real deal, which is pretty crazy. He would also kind of dress like super Dave Osborne. And at the same time, he's selling these very cool looking miniature toys and everyone always loves miniatures and their cars, kind of a perfect storm that came together with the micro machines. So Looking at the actual toys, like I said, they came out in 1986 and right off the bat, they included quite a lot of different varieties, which was a smart approach because you don't want to just bring out a handful, see if it's going to hit and then, you know, have to kind of play catch up to get other iterations and versions out. They were, I think, and I mean, you can't, there's always a bit of luck in anything, but I mean, they were anticipating success. So they put out a lot of varieties. So there was a ton of options immediately. And they were based around, I don't know if you remember these, like I remember having some of the early sets. They they based them around popular cars and trucks, but they'd also include other vehicles. Later on, they would get more into specific cars and stuff like that. But if you remember some of the early other versions of the vehicles, they had trains, they had like emergency vehicles, they had tanks, they had boats, which were really cool. They had helicopters, little airplanes. And they also included some very cool play sets, which were also sized down and they could also act as a carrying case for the vehicles. And you remember like the little ones with the, like the tracks and the little mini city and they would fold open and kind of like a compact all in one toy, which is always a big appeal. And along with that, they would also create some very cool varieties of vehicles, such as, do you remember the color changing cars that, um, how do those work? Some went in water or they changed depending on like the heat that went on them. And then there was also the private eyes where you would peek inside and see the little illustrations and stuff like that. In the Again, in the 80s, they would introduce the Insider series, which I vaguely remembered these more until I was like looking back at all this. And the Insider series is it would include a small vehicle that came inside the standard micro machine, if you remember that. So the body and the chassis were connected with a hinge and you could lift up the larger micro machine and find a smaller and completely different car underneath it, which was very cool. And and that's one of the big appeals here with the micro machines. It was a pretty creative toy line. And if you think how unique they are already, like the fact that you're just putting out these miniaturized versions of cars is kind of, is a cool enough concept as it is, but then they get really creative with it too. So I think as a consumer and as a kid, you're looking at all of this and, and seeing all these different versions and iterations as opposed to just a, like with, you know, no disrespect to like Mattel and Hot Wheels and whatever. It was always just the same cars, you know, like the different versions of the cars, but it was like always a continuation of whatever came before it. With the Micro Machines, they did put out all these different versions and a little more creativity, that enough that you're already familiar with the product and now you want to see these new versions of it. So either way, you know, you put all this together and it works very well for Galoob. So from the introduction in 1986, Micro Machines was the largest selling toy car line in the United States for the next three to four years, which is pretty insane when we're just talking about everything with the other, you know, Matchbox and everything like that. It Micro Machines exceeded, this is nuts, the, it can, exceeded the combined sales of Hot Wheels, Matchbox, and Majorette combined. That's how big of an impact this toy had in the 1980s. So moving along, obviously, like, they're now branching out into other um, kind of properties and whatever, and that leads to the Micro Machines video game, which honestly might be my favorite video game of all time, the original one for the NES. It really 
captured the essence of micro machines it was fun the, the game was challenging as hell at the same time it kind of had that you know honey i shrunk the kids feel like where anytime where you're shrunk down and like you know you're racing on the breakfast table and on the pool table and everything like that it was kind of where you like you're putting yourself into that world always a big hit and it's already with a property you're very familiar with so that's my memories of the game is like even if you blew it on a course which would happen a lot you immediately wanted to try again i i, I don't remember too many other games where i honestly would never give up no matter how frustrated it was just because it was fun and you like you're just driven to succeed where other games you just be like screw it and walk away this one i don't know something about it drew you in that i don't know if that was the same for everyone or for you listening or whatever but they had a bunch of different versions that came out over the years but like what i'm talking about is the original one for the nes and it was originally developed by codemasters and it also came out on things like the amiga the sega genesis it was even out for the ms dos if you had that version so it's interesting there was some licensing issues with nintendo and codemasters which used part of a previous game called california buggy boys and that was the actual base of the game um, so when it first came out, when it was first released, it had a major glitch, which reversed at the start of the first race, causing to gain, like if you, on the, on the first like courses or races, if you like reverse for whatever reason, or, or sort of jump the gun, it would cause the game to crash. And that was like across the board. I don't remember it. I don't, ha- I didn't have it immediately. So I never had the versions that did that. So, um, that whole thing was sort of falling apart. But then as it was, you know, that, that bug was fixing everything. And then when it was fully released by the NES by Comerica um, and Nintendo originally had wanted the development halted because Codemasters didn't have a license from them. And then they would sue Galoob over the sales of the whole thing. Ultimately then the courts ruled in favor uh, for Galoob and this would cause lower sales than Nintendo had been hoping for. So it was kind of like, obviously you have no idea about these when you're a kid, you just want the game, but there was a whole mess right off the bat from the first glitches to the lawsuits that prevented the sales and and everything like that. So if you remember, this was a top down racing game, meaning you observe from above and not in the car, which works perfectly in this format where you're kind of shrunk down and put into another world and on unconventional tracks. Like I mentioned, that sort of honey, I shrunk the kids effect, but without a sports car. And I don't know if you remember, we had the gold cartridge version, which I swear I traded to some kid for a few crappy games. I didn't want anymore, but I remember specifically had that gold cartridge. And like I said, you know, some of the Epic tracks had the pool table. There was racing in the garden. You're on the breakfast table and it had spilled cereal and giant Cheerios the bathtub course was amazing. We got to race the boats. There was the little Formula One cars. There was the tanks that could shoot. Uh, it, it, remember, if you went off the track, you you know you went to try to go exploring, you were immediately placed back on it. You could compete in a Micro Machines Challenge against computer races or the head-to-head challenges. Like I said, I don't know if this game really received the, the critical acclaim um, that it might have deserved, or or maybe it was just me that preferred this, but it just had that addict- addictiveness factor um, that I mentioned that kind of drew you in. And it's like, I don't remember a game being more frustrating than that, but at the same time, I just wanted to keep, keep going with it. A lot of critics did praise it, and it appeared in a lot of top game lists. So it, it did make quite a big hit. Okay, and then I mentioned earlier about its... Uh, other inclusion in a Christmas classic, and that's of, cl- of course Micro Machines and Home Alone, and that was their big, <laughs> big screen debut. And you know, like besides Lego, there might not have been anything ever like worse created to step on than a Micro Machine. And you can probably just either ask your parents or you remember the, the terror of stepping on one of these things in bare feet. Uh, and their use as a torture device made that nice little appearance in Home Alone. So you remember, obviously, in setting up defense of his house, Kevin McAllister placed the micro machines on the floor around the Christmas ornaments, and you know the rest of it. If you haven't seen Home Alone, I can't help you. Um, it was funny, though. There were concerns by parents uh, when the movie was released that kids were going to start copying the booby traps from Home Alone, 
and leave traps <laughs> containing micro machines all over the house. And again, this wasn't really necessary as if there was a loose micro machine anywhere, there's a good chance someone's just going to step on it. Same thing with Lego. They just like sort of a magnets for their, their feet. There, there's a funny thing. I don't know how I saw this, but there was a, a medical examiner who went back and reviewed <laughs> the injuries from home alone that Marv and Harry suffered um, and questions that they would not have been able to recover in time to make an appearance in the sequel. That's how catastrophic the injuries they suffered were. A guy actually went back and reviewed the whole thing. Okay, so I'll start winding it down here. So like any toy that's a big hit, Um, you know, they would evolve it over the years and that would happen with micro machines into the nineties actually. And then they would start tying in other properties. So they had star Wars, they had star Trek micro machines, they had James Bond micro machines for some reason, Indiana Jones, things I'd never aware of or wasn't aware of, uh, Galoob would become part of Hasbro in 1988, but the micro machines didn't really fare too well past that. They tried to repackage the toys But it just didn't catch on. By 2006, the only time you would see the brand name of Micro Machines was on um, a detail panel of the Star Wars and Transformers Titanium series. So then when The Force Awakens came out, Hasbro released some new sets of kind of a theme Micro Machines, like to do with everything with um, The Force Awakens. But it only lasted a year. Again, like, I don't know the appeal's not there or little kids who just obviously micro machines means nothing to them. They probably would rather have the actual star Wars toys. I think it's just, you know, anytime there's an old property, you just throw it at the wall, see what sticks it's worth, worth a shot or whatever. In that case, it just didn't work, but you know, like all in all micro machines, a great toy, a classic of the eighties and actually a huge success story. Like I said, where for that three to four year period toy, they outsold all of their, toy cars combined that's how much of a hit they made they had a great video game like you said they probably existed in your house at some point you might not remember buying them or getting them as presents but they just sort of appeared it's kind of like lego like you don't really remember getting or buying lego you just have lego it just it's there it accumulates it appears so they you know it's a definitely a novelty toy but it's one that still had kind of a charm about them like in the long run um, I, they probably, you know, didn't replace Hot Wheels or Matchbox, but definitely made a huge dent in the 80s toy market and your foot. And like, I don't know now if they are, it's something I'll have to look up later. I don't know if any of them are specific collector's items where a lot of like old Hot Wheels are worth a fortune. So, uh, and then it's, I don't know if that's something that'll ever be reissued again. Like, you know, like they always sort of go back to the well with old toys. Um, if something was a hit 25, 30 years ago, there's maybe reason to think it might be hit again. So, you know, maybe in five, 10 years, you might see them release it all brand new again, see if they can capture a whole new market. But I mean, the fact they re-released them um, when the force awakens came out, but then again, that then doesn't really make them micro machines toy. It makes it a star Wars toy. So we'll see if that ever comes to fruition and they make a big comeback or not. Okay. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, like I said, subscribe to the podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, you can subscribe there, and then you get the shows automatically sent to you. If you really like it, leave it a rating and review, but obviously you don't have to. I just appreciate you taking the time to listen to the show. I know there's so many podcasts out there now, so the fact you're just checking this one out means a lot, and I will be back again soon.